Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War with Bang and Dang. Guess what, guys? It's good news. We're going to have an episode longer than 22 minutes this time. Oh my gosh. I guarantee it. But we do have three battles, but the first two are literally uh, nothings. And then uh, our last battle of the day is going to be a nice little uh, little battle with some names we haven't heard yet in this war. So hmm. good stuff going on. And this is our first official uh, released episode on time uh, since we've been on suspended from YouTube. So. Hey, if we're not any, if we're not again by this time. Uh, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> uh, with that, go to our YouTube at Bang Dang Network and give us a subscription. It's Eclipse Shorts YouTube exclusives, including a uh, uh, a dart league that we, we play darts. It's, it's a dart league. It's funny. We can say how corrupt the FBI and all that shit is, but we can't say things about somebody <laughs> it just don't make no sense we can't right it don't make no sense things that are most likely true as well so right i mean yeah i don't, I don't understand uh, it I don't, I don't understand well we know why for you guys who don't know we got suspended for our uh according to wikipedia show that we do and uh, we read the wikipedia article of kamala, kamala harris so we, we got suspended for misinformation supposedly mm -hmm. uh i don't On know a lock page that you can't edit don't know what the misinformation was because they didn't tell you exactly what it was. They just said misinformation. Mm. So on the locked page where you can't edit. Go figure. A uh, week suspended and three in a row or three in the ninety day period, and our shit's gone. So let's. I think we'll be all right. Hopefully, uh, we don't say something wrong about the uh, union or something. Heaven forbid we don't get Barack Obama next. <laughs> all right. Well, we got the Revolutionary War, so coming up next. Which oh, that's right. well, shouldn't be too bad, right? <laughs> we'll see. We got the Battle of Collierville, the Battle of, Ro battle of Rogersville, and the big battle of the day, Droop Mountain, starting off second Battle of Collierville. Apparently, we've done one already. Yes. Which took place November 3rd, 1863, during a demonstration on Collierville, Tennessee, by Brigadier General James Chalmers of the Confederate States Army. Four minor battles occurred in 1863 in Shelby County during a three-month period. Two of them uh, that were the largest occurred on October 11th and November 3rd, which this one is, I guess. Battle on October 11th was the largest land battle fought in the county ever. November 3rd, 1863, the battle was intended to be a Confederate cavalry raid to break up the Memphis and Charleston Railroad behind Sherman's 15th Army Corps. This was in process of marching to the relief of uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Sherman's army was. Right. But when Confederate Brigadier General James Chalmers, leading a cavalry division riding up from Mississippi, learned that they're only that the only one regiment uh, from the Union was left to defend Collierville, he decided to attack. All right. So he's, there's only one? Gotta get him now. He supposed Union Colonel Edward Hatch possessed fewer men stationed at Collierville and at Germantown, which was five miles to the west, than he actually did. Mm. Ooh, Hatch's scouts warned him of Chalmers' approach from the south, so he ordered Collierville's defenders to be prepared and rode from Germantown with cavalry reinforcements. Oh, shit. Chalmers, as he had done only three weeks earlier, attacked from the south with McCulloch's and Slemons brigades. The Union post was defended by eight companies of the 7th Illinois Cavalry and two howitzers. Uh oh. Hatch quickly arrived with the 6th Illinois and 2nd Iowa Cavalry. They said, let's go. Mm. Confederates launched an attack with only part of Slemons' brigade, believing faulty intelligence that it was lightly defended. Oh, no. Wow, the Union 2nd Iowa Cavalry opened fire with their Colts, new model revolving rifles, cool. and they repulsed the attack. Surprised by the unexpected appearance of the enemy on his flanks, Chalmers concluded that he was outnumbered. He called off the battle, and he said, do you ward off that Union pursuit? And he withdrew back to old Mississippi. He was like, I don't like Tennessee. He reported six dead, 89 wounded or missing, including Colonel James Z. George. Uh, he was commanding the 5th Mississippi Cavalry. Oh, he lost a cavalry man? Well... Hatch reported the loss of approximately 60 casualties. The Memphis and Charleston Railroad remained open to Tusc Tuscumbia, Alabama. And uh, Union troops were like, we got free ride. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to wrap that one up and bring us <laughs> right into the Battle of Rogersville, which is one paragraph long. That Chalmers should be uh, immediately demoted. Why? Huh? Why? Chalmers? Why? He just led his men to a freaking massacre almost. Well, he didn't know. <laughs> That's his own fault. Well, the Battle of Rogersville was a conflict in and around the town of Rogersville, Tennessee. 
on the morning of November 6, 1863, between the U.S. Army 3rd Brigade, 4th Cavalry Division, and the Confederates uh, Army Jones's Brigade, and uh, the 2nd Cavalry Brigade and the 8th Virginia Cavalry. Because Federal forces were caught largely by surprise, the Confederates under Brigadier General William Jones were able to recapture Rogersville, along with significant supplies from the town's railroad storehouse. Oh, no shit. Union casualties, Battery M lost about four men killed and 35 catcher, captured. All of its guns were spiked and abandoned, oh. but 86 men, 50 horses, and some equipment avoided capture. Oh, that's nice. Good for them. A lot of horses there. Good for them, right? All right. Ooh, the biggity biggity one. Battle of biggity biggity Drew Mountain. This occurred in Pocahontas County, West Virginia, on 6th of November, 1863. All the way back in April 17th, 1861, representatives of the Commonwealth of Virginia held the Virginia Succession Convention, passed an ordinance of secession, and declared secession from the old United States of America. The ordinance was ratified by popular referendum on the 29th to 23rd of May, 1861. And Virginia later joined, as we all know. Many people in the northwestern portion of the state preferred to remain loyal to the United States. Yep. Delegates from the, uh, from that portion of the state met in June at the Second Wheeling Convention, 19th of June, 1861. They approved a plan to establish a alternative loyal state government that would be located in Wheeling, Virginia. All right. Well, although loyal Virginians approved their own statehood on October 24th, 1861, West Virginia did not become a state. Until June twentieth, eighteen sixty three. Really? Uh, after the so creation, just recently yes. in our little storyline here, <laughs> our little storyline. Hmm. After the creation of West Virginia, regular Confederate Army soldiers still operated within the state. Clearly, residents of the new state were not all loyal to the Union, and the state continued to be plagued by bushwhackers and partisan rangers practicing guerrilla warfare. All right, I don't think it was the best time to be admitted states right. to, the, to the Union, especially one tiny ass one. And, right. Well, well, West Virginia is huge. Well, not West Virginia. It's decent size. That's not that big. Hmm. <laughs> Historians estimate that the residents of West Virginia provided twenty to 22,000 soldiers to each side in the American Civil War. Damn. Well, that's just in West Virginia. Virginia. <laughs> Lewisburg, located in West Virginia near the border with Virginia, was one of the communities that supported the Confederacy. Five skirmishes occurred at Lewisburg during the war, plus a small battle in 1862 and the town's capture and brief occupation in 1863. Oh. Uh, by the unit, I'm assuming. It's, there's Confederate supporters. Right. Well, West Virginia being a new state, it had rugged terrain. A few good well, roads. Well, that's not why it had rugged <laughs> terrain. Like, you know, your new state, you got to be plagued with rugged terrain for rugged a few hundred terrain. years. Uh, uh, they had few good few good roads, few sediments, and its people were very, very, very poor. They're mountain people, man. One important asset for the Union Army was the Baltimore Ohio Railroad, aka B and O Railroad. Really. Uh, which had rail line in the northern part of West Virginia that was often targeted by the Confederate Army and its sympathizers. Army resources were needed for the railroad's protection. The Union Army leaders normally considered troops in West Virginia to be a defensive force that would handle Confederate raids and confront guerrillas and bushwhackers. Troops were typically scattered in small detachments across the old West Virginia. All right, a significant portion of the fight in West Virginia was related to railroads. While the Union had an important railroad in the northern part of West Virginia, the Confederacy had the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, which was located in Virginia close to West Virginia's southern border. <laughs> Jeez, this railroad was used by the Confederacy for moving troops and supplies between, the, so they're like sandwiched in between right. two railroads. Uh, it was used for supplies, running supplies in between those states and connected to more railroads at Lynchburg, Virginia and Bristol, Tennessee. I would hope so. It also had telegraph wires along its line mm. and uh, important salt and lead mines were located along its route near Wytheville, Virginia. No shit that's where you get the number two pencils huh <laughs> the lead mine was a source for an uh an estimated one-third of the lead pencils produced <laughs> <laughs> one-third of the lead used by the confederacy to produce bullets for its armies though Ooh, right. a lead bullet too mm. eat this lead right, right. obviously that's right. what bullets are made out of. Right. 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 multiple raids on the railroad originated from west virginia they mid July 1863 raid by the Union Cavalry and Mounted Infantry, known as the Withville Raid or Tolins Raid, it failed to inflict permanent damage to the railroad and did not reach the mines. August 1863 plan raid on Lewisburg, which Confederate leaders worried was a raid on a railroad, ended when Brigadier General William W. Averill was handsomely repulsed by a brigade commanded by Colonel George Patton in the Battle of the White Sulphur Springs. Brigadier General Brendan Franklin Kelly was a commander of the Union Army's Department of West Virginia. Kelly reported to General Chief Henry Hallett. 
through his chief of staff, Brigadier General George Cullum, Halleck let Kelly know that he wanted uh, the Confederates out of Lewisburg and yep. the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad disabled. So get those sons of bitches out of there, and I want that railroad disabled. Yes. On uh, October 23rd, 1863, Kelly ordered Avril to move his command south from Beverly, West Virginia, and attack a Confederate force station near Lewisburg and Greenbrier County, West Virginia. Fantastic. Droop Mountain was not part of the plan. Okay. The objective was to capture or drive away old rebel forces at or near Lewisburg. A second Union force, which was from Brigadier General Eliakum Scammon's 3rd Division, would move southeast from Charleston to meet Avro and Lewisburg and provide assistance. The Charleston force would consist of two regiments of infantry and two regiments of cavalry, plus some artillery. After Lewisburg, Avro was to attack the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, if <laughs> practicable. Unit infantry that was not mounted would remain in Lewisburg, while mounted troops, which were cavalry and mounted infantry, including Duffy's, well, ca- they would proceed. Cavalry doesn't just mean you ride a horse. Cavalry, that's where your fucking cannons and guns, big guns and shit are. And then they would right? proceed further south to Monroe County and right. cross into Virginia, I would say yes. Uh, their objective was to destroy the railroad bridge over the New River, which was less than 10 miles from the railroad's Dublin station near New Bern, West Virginia, uh, regular Virginia. One historian considers the destruction of the railroad bridge in line to be the principal goal of Avro's expedition. At the time, Confederate Lieutenant General James Longstreet uh, was in Tennessee with two divisions of the Army of Northern Virginia. Serious damage to the railroad would disrupt his ability to communicate with Army leadership and make it difficult for his return uh, to the east. Yeah, because he's over there helping out. What's his name? Yeah. At Chickamauga. He was trying to, at uh, least. Uh, if Avro determined that an attack on the railroad was uh, impracticable, he was to send his infantry and one battery back to Beverly. All right. The remaining portion of his command would move to New Creek and get resupplied. Oh, New Creek. It was originally known as Patty Town and later as Kaiser. It was a stop on the B&O Railroad near the West Virginia-Maryland border. With no attack on the railroad, Duffy's command would hold Lewisburg or fall back to Meadow Bluff, West Virginia. Good for him. Anyways, in the first, uh, November 1863, the Confederate Army controlled much of the Greenbrier Valley in West Virginia. Confederate Major General Sam Jones commanded the Department of West Virginia in East Tennessee, and his headquarters were about 75 miles south of Lewisburg, which is in West Virginia, at the Dublin Railroad Depot for the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad in Virginia. Okay. Although Jones did not participate directly in this battle, the men and territory were his responsibility, as were the railroad and bridge near his headquarters that were targeted by the Union. He was in eastern Tennessee when Avril began his expedition and returned to Dublin around November 6th. Brigadier General John Eagles commanded a brigade that was headquartered in Lewisburg. Colonel William L. Mudwall Jackson Mudwall had a small cavalry brigade that patrolled in Huntersville, Hillsborough region of West Virginia. Why is he called Mudwall? I don't know. His cousin is Thomas oh. Stonewall. So there was three Jacksons named Mudwall Jackson. Good for them. Anyway. Further east, Brigadier General John D. M. Bowden commanded the Shenandoah Valley District. Brigadier General Albert G. Jenkins, who was a Cabal County, West Virginia native, was recovering from a wound received at the Battle of Gettysburg. But two regiments and a battery from his brigade were detached to the Greenbrier County area of West Virginia. Colonel Milton at J. Ferguson temporarily commanded Jenkins' brigade. Okay. Brigadier General W. W. Averill, huh? Oh, cool. Beginning Kelly's plan, Averill's fourth separated brigade departed from Beverly on November 1st, 1863. Many of his men were already familiar with the territory and opposition because they had been defeated a few months oh. earlier during August in the Battle of White Sulphur Springs. Not a battle. <laughs> The brigade consisted of two infantry regiments, three mounted infantry regiments, one cavalry regiment, and a portion of an independent cavalry battalion, right. two light batteries, and a signal corps detachment. Two infantry regiments were the 10th West Virginia and the 28th Ohio, while the mounted infantry regiments were the 2nd West Virginia, 3rd West Virginia, and the 8th West Virginia. Fantastic. A lot of West Virginians. Guys, should be. The infantry was often led by Colonel Augustus Moore. Often? And, yeah. Oh. And Colonel John H. Oley usually led the mounted infantry. Moore was a veteran of Florida's Second Seminole War and Colonel of his regiment in the Mexican-American War. Yeah, look at this guy. Averill's Cavalry was the 14th Pennsylvania Cavalry Regiment and a battalion of six companies from West Virginia, Illinois, and Ohio. The Cavalry was led by Colonel James M. Schoonmaker. Schoonmaker. Yeah, Schoonmaker. And he was armed with carbines. All right. The infantry, mounted or not, had muzzle loader and field muskets. That <laughs> sucks for to be them. Based on early reports, Averill's brigade had a maximum of 3,855 officers and, and men present for duty. 
All right, yeah, the mounted portion of Scammon's force commanded by Brigadier General Alfred Duffy departed from Charleston for Lewisburg on November 3rd. It numbered 900, uh, 970 officers and men with 1,025 horses. Damn. And initially it consisted of the 2nd West Virginia Cavalry Regiment, 34th Ohio Mounted Infantry Regiment, and Simmons Battery. Most of the men were familiar with Lewisburg, which was about 110 miles away. One soldier from the 2nd West Virginia described this excursion as the 3rd Expedition to Lewisburg. Oh, that's nice. Good for him. Oh, those guys. He described it. Good for him. Oh, you know, just, we're going to attribute a whole damn quote to somebody, but not even fucking say his name. Right. Both regiments were involved in a July 1863 raid on the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, where they captured the town of Withville, but inflicted little. I think it's Whiteville. Probably, but inflicted little permanent damage to the railroad and lost both of their colonels. Oh, no. Fourth of uh, November, 1863, after crossing the Gauley River at Gauley Bridge, Old Duffy was delayed by blockades in the road that were so numerous that a new road had to be dug around them in some instances. Two infantry regiments commanded by Colonel Carby White. Carby White, nice. <laughs> he joined Duffy's mountain men on the 5th of November. At Tyree's Tavern in Fayette County. They're all, bunch of, they're all drunk. They're like, where are you going? You mind if we join you? All right. First few days of the expedition, Ambrose Brigade traveled south over the most direct route and encountered a few bands of guerrillas and small detachments of CSA soldiers. Right. They reached the summit of Cheat Mountain at noon on November 2nd and camped that evening in the Greenbrier Valley in Pocahontas County. November 3rd, a squadron of the 8th West Virginia Mounted Infantry, which Avro had sent on a different route, was discovered near Green Bank by a detachment of about 350 men from the 19th Virginia Cavalry Regiment, commanded by Lieutenant George W. Sipple. After a small class, the squadron of West Virginians continued south and reunited with Avro's main force near the Green Bank, near Green Bank and Arbovale, which was about 20 miles north of Huntersville. Cool. Right. right. You wouldn't believe it ran in these jerk offs down there. Right. <laughs> Sons of bitches. Sipple reported then countered to Colonel Jackson, who was headquartered with the main body of the 19th Virginia Cavalry, just northwest of Hillsborough, in Mill Point. Jackson warned Colonel William W. Arnett, who was eight miles north with the 20th Virginia Cavalry Regiment near the Greenbrier Mount River in Marling Bottom. He, he said, here, buddy, I'm warning you of this. Jackson also sent the news to nearby detachments and Brigadier General John Eagles in Lewisburg. Good for him. <sighs> Seiple's detachment became cut off and did not rejoin the 19th Virginia Cavalry until days later, oh. depriving Jackson of much-needed manpower. Damn. While Jackson repositioned his small brigade, Avril moved further south and went into camp. His advance camped about 15 miles north of Huntersville. Avril and Jackson were now aware of each other's proximity, and Jackson needed reinforcements for a small brigade. Jackson's brigade consisted of the 19th and 20th Virginia Cavalry Regiments, a cavalry battalion consisting of four companies commanded by Major Joseph R. Kessler, and a battery that consisted of two 12-pounder howitzers. Only 750 men were available for him uh, three days later at Droop Mountain. Uh-oh. Wow. Uh-oh. Averill resumed his march southward at about 7 a.m. on the 4th of November and burned two enemy campsites. Arriving at Huntersville. Like, we don't give a shit. Right. We ain't coming back. Arriving at Huntersville and finding no enemy troops, he determined that a portion of the 19th Virginia Cavalry was six miles west at Marling Bottom and devised a plan to cut them off from their headquarters at Mill Point. About noon, he sent Screwmaker and the 14th Pennsylvania Cavalry with the 3rd West Virginia Mounted Infantry southwest on Beaver Creek Road. Their objective was to reach the intersection with a with the Marling Bottom Road before the 19th Cavalry of Virginia got there from Marling Bottom. And he was to prevent the Virginians from reaching Mill Point and Hillsboro. Like, can you do that? All right, well, Avro was somewhat correct. Colonel Arnett and the 20th Virginia Cavalry Regiment, not the 19th, were at Marlin Bottom, which is eight miles north of Mill Point. Mm. So, right. uh, four hours later, Colonel Ole and the 8th West Virginia Mounted Infantry, which had been in the rear of Avro's command, arrived in Huntersville. Hoping to trap a portion of the Confederate cavalry between Schoonmaker and Ole, Avro immediately sent Ole west to the Marlin Bottom with a force that consisted of the 8th West Virginia, 2nd West Virginia Mounted Infantry, and a section of Ewing's artillery. Fantastic. All right. Patrick. All right. Well, I was earlier, Arnett and his uh, brigade commander, Jackson, learned of the Union force at Beaver Creek Road. Arnett departed from Marling Bottom for Mill Point to unite with Jackson, setting blockades on the road as he went. Jackson sent a portion of the 19th Virginia Cavalry under the command of Lieutenant Colonel William P. Thompson, one mile north on the Beaver Creek Road to blockade the road, long enough for Arnett to pass through to Mill Point. Thompson and Schoonmaker began skirmishing about 3 p.m. Around dusk, Ole entered Marlene Bottom, but Arnett was already gone and passed through the intersection near Mill Point. After dark, while Thompson continued skirmishing, Averill's trap had failed. Mm, well, elsewhere during the afternoon of November 4th, 
Two regiments from Jenkins' Confederate Cavalry Brigade were arrested in Greenbrier County while their commander, Colonel Ferguson, consulted with Brigadier General Eccles. Ferguson divided his brigade to assist Jackson at Mill Point and to protect Lewisburg. His 16th Virginia Cavalry Regiment was sent five miles west of Lewisburg to guard one of the approaches to town. A portion of his 14th Virginia Cavalry Regiment guarded a second approach. The remaining six companies from the 14th Virginia, commanded by Colonel James Cochran, rode north to assist Jackson at Mill Point. All right, got a little plan there then, huh? I guess. Decent. Decent. That very evening at Mill Point, Jackson's Confederates assumed defensive positions on the southwest side of the Stamping Creek. With Arnett commanding the infantry, which was dismounted cavalry, uh, Schoonmaker fought through Thompson's blockade, took a position on the northeast side of the creek. Two camps were separated by 300 yards and a creek, and both sides could see each other. Damn, that ain't that crazy. Ole was still in Marling Bottom, and Averill remained in Huntersville with the infantry and one battery. Further east in the Shenandoah Valley, Brigadier General John Imboden was notified that Averill was in Greenbrier County with a large force. Uh oh. Early in the morning, November 5th, Averill moved his infantry from Huntersville toward Mill Point and only left Marlin Bottom for the same destination. Schoonmaker believed he was outnumbered three to one and placed his force in a defensive position. Uh oh. He began skirmishing with Jackson's two regiments around daylight. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson also made use of his two howitzers. Uh, I hope so. I bet you did. Uh, which made the situation difficult for Schoonmaker because he had no artillery. Ooh, how often do we ever hear that? Right. Ole, who was about nine miles away, could hear the artillery and knew that Schoonmaker had none. He oh, said, shit, we got to like, get there. Like, damn. Sucks to be that guy. He hurried his two mounted regiments and battery toward the front. There you go. Get some guns there, bud. Upon arrival, he found Schoonmaker facing strong pressure. Schoonmaker had him dismount his two regiments and deploy them on the right, which was the west side. While Schoonmaker and his two regiments took the left, which is the east side. Ewing's battery, which had larger range than uh, Jackson's howitzers, was placed in between. Jackson was aware of the Union reinforcement and also knew that his howitzers... I assume he would be. All of a sudden, they're firing big-ass guns and shit. Right. He also knew that his howitzers did not have the range of the Union guns. He chose to fall back to Droop Mountain, which was just south of Hillsborough and about 24 miles north of Lewisburg. All right, Arnett led his men to the top of the mountain adjacent to the road, using a route that had forests and hills for cover. Lieutenant Colonel Thompson and 32 men from the cavalry covered the rear and defended against a Union cavalry assault. <clears throat> when Lurdy's battery, already positioned on the mountain, began shelling the pursuing Union cavalry, all fighting ended. Avro and his infantry arrived at Mill Point around the time Jackson was falling back to Droop Mountain. You missed him again, bud. The Union soldiers went into camp around 2 p.m. after fighting stopped. Abro, whose November 7th report said he attacked Jenkins in front of Mill Point, actually Jackson it was, said there was a trifling loss on either side. Mm-hmm. Right. Trifling doesn't mean nothing. Right. When Jackson and Arnett reached the summit of Droop Mountain on the 5th of November, they deployed Arnett's 20th Ute Virginia Cavalry in, in a defensive position at a high point next to the road. The crest of Droop Mountain is 3,100 feet high. Wow. And Jackson could see Union Army camps around Hillsboro. Cool. Jackson had about 750 men since a squadron was cut off further north in Pocahontas County, which was Sipples. About 100 miles away, Embodden's uh, brigade had moved to Buffalo Gap in Virginia's Augusta County, but did not depart from there until the 6th of November. He had about 600 mounted men and a section of artillery. All right. At Lewisburg, Eccles decided to bring more reinforcements to Jackson despite his worry that another Union force might attack from the west and cause the entire Confederate force to be surrounded. It would be. Duffy was, in fact, approaching from the west. He was right. Eccles covered half the distance to Droop Mountain on November 5th and camped at Spring Creek near the Greenbrier River. That evening, Cochran and six companies from the 14th Virginia Cavalry arrived at Droop Mountain as the first group of reinforcements for Jackson. 2 a.m., November 6th, Eccles resumed his march to Droop Mountain. Okay. After about two miles, he realized that the road from Fallen Springs to Hillsboro could be used by Union soldiers to attack Jackson's extreme right flank. Wary of a Union trap, he detached the 26th Infantry Battalion with one piece of artillery to block the road. Good for you. Well, look at you. Right. That's what I like about you, uh, uh, Eccles. Guy. You're yeah. quick on your feet. Now, Everell was up early in the morning on the 6th of November planning his strategy. He began moving the troops from Mills Point to uh, Hillsboro shortly after sunrise. Skirmishers went further south on diverse maneuvers for the purpose of confusing the old Rebs. As the Confederate skirmishers fell back to the mountain, Averroes inspected the terrain and enemy positions. He determined that a frontal assault would be a disaster, and he made a plan for a three-sided dismounted attack. While a portion of his troops on his left would divert the attention of the Confederates, a large portion would flank the enemy on the old right. 
Well, in the final phase, Moore's troops would attack from the front and right. Ooh. Beginning the flanking maneuver, Colonel Augustus Moore departed shortly after 9 a.m. with 1,175 men. His force included the 10th West Virginia Infantry, 28th Ohio, Company C of the 16th Illinois Cavalry, and a small group of signalmen from the 68th New York Infantry led by Lieutenant Abraham Merritt. Right. Colonel Thomas Harris led the 10th West Virginia Infantry, and Lieutenant Colonel Gottfried Becker led Moore's 28th Ohio Infantry when needed. Ooh. Moore's force fell back about a mile and then began an obscure circuitous route of six miles to nine miles that would put them on an enemy's left flank. Schoonmaker and 14th Pennsylvania Cavalry moved to the left, which was Confederate right, with the artillery, where they made sure they had the attention of Jackson's men at the top of the mountain. The Union battery was positioned on a hill that was 500 feet lower than the Confederate guns, making it difficult to achieve some accuracy as the Confederate cannons. I assume... Brigadier General Echoes arrived at Droop Mountain with reinforcements about 9 a.m. November 6th. Bringing it's easier to shoot down than his up uh, with a cannon. With anything. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, he arrived November 6th, bringing Colonel Ferguson from Jenkins' brigade with him. Echoes brought the 22nd Virginia Infantry Regiment, the 23rd Virginia Infantry Battalion, a.k.a. Derrick's Battalion. Hey, Derek. Chapman's Battery and Jackson's Battery from Jenkins' Brigade. <laughs> Their arrival was acknowledged by loud rebel yells and music from a band, making cool. sure both sides knew about the reinforcement. Nice. Echoes assumed command of all forces and yeah, so. right. And Colonel George S. Patton commanded Echoes Brigade. Cool. Major Robert A. Bailey, they called him Old Gus. He commanded the brigade's 22nd Virginia Infantry Regiment and the 23rd Virginia Infantry Battalion was commanded by Major William Blessing. Such a blessing, William. Uh, Major William McLaughlin commanded the two batteries. Echols placed his two batteries in his right close to the Colonel Jackson's two howitzers. Blessing's uh, battalion, which is a.k.a. Derrick's, was placed on the Confederate right on the right side of the road to Lewisburg. Bailey and the 22nd Virginia were placed behind the artillery. The total Confederate force engaged in this battle, mostly dismounted cavalry, numbered 1,700. Nice. Throughout most of the battle, Echols would command the Confederate right, Jackson the center, and the left would be commanded by Lieutenant Colonel William P. Thompson. Not to be confused with Lieutenant Colonel Francis W. Thompson. Why would it be? William Francis P. W. <laughs> Who commanded the 3rd West Virginia Mounted Infantry? 3rd West Virginia. Right. I mean, I could see it. Well, these are Virginia and William or Colonel Thompson, you know. Sure. Although some skirmishing already happened, historians consider artillery shots fired at Droop Mountain by Schoonmaker using Keeper's Battery, which occurred around 11 a.m. as the beginning of the battle. No. Artillery fire continued all day, but the Union Canyons were not able to hit any, any enemy uh, artillery. Really? Confederate artillery was accurate and eventually killed almost all the horses belonging to Ewan's, Ewan's Battery. Aww. Keeper's Battery had two people killed and five wounded. By noon, Schoonmaker realized he could not hit enemy artillery. Well, you took hours. So he withdrew two of his three sections of Keeper's Battery to preserve the guns and ammunition. Good for you, bud. It only took fucking right. 11 a.m. by noon. Oh, okay. An hour. Between noon and one, Averroes readied his men for the center and right center dismounted assault. In the case of Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Scott's 2nd West Virginia Mounted Infantry, the men dismounted near the front and remained out of sight while waiting for orders. But not out of mine. Mm. Scott's men were positioned on the very right center. Between Ole's 8th West Virginia Mounted Infantry on the left and Colonel Francis S. Thompson's 3rd West Virginia Mounted Infantry on the right. Around 1 p.m., Schoonmaker repositioned two sections of the artillery while preparing to assist in the frontal attack on his right. At that very same time, Lieutenant Joseph W. Daniels of Keeper's Battery was decapitated oh. by artillery fire while standing next to Schoonmaker. Can you imagine that? He just looks over and the dude's head's gone. Uh, the main body of Schoonmaker's <laughs> troops did not get to the foot of the mountain in time to assist the three regiments making the frontal assault, although his advance did. I'm assuming his advance did. That's why they're in advance. <laughs> right. On the far right, or Confederate's left, Colonel Moore encountered the Confederate left flank about 1.45 p.m. 28th Ohio Infantry and Lieutenant Colonel Becker led the way, and Captain uh, they met Captain Jacob Marshall of the 19th Virginia Cavalry, who was reinforced by a group of 50 dismounted cavalrymen. Then they were led by Major Joseph Kessler. The Confederate force, numbering about 200, surprised Becker with a charge from close by that drove the 28th Ohio Infantry back. Understanding he was outnumbered, William Thompson sent a request to Echoes for more reinforcements. Echoes responded by sending 300 men from the 23rd Virginia Infantry Battalion and two companies from the 14th Virginia Cavalry, Company B and Company I. Oh, good for him. Or is that Company 1? Probably 1. Or I, since right. it's B. 
<laughs> These two companies were equipped for close quarter fighting. Oh, that's cool. As they were armed with sabers, pistols, and carbines. Nice. He's like, what you got? What you got? What you got? What you got? More responded to the initial Confederate thrust by ordering more. Yeah. Moore responded to the initial Confederate thrust by ordering his Ohio infantrymen to lie down and fire by file. Colonel Thomas M. Harris and the 10th West Virginia Infantry moved to the front on Moore's right and began pushing their outnumbered enemy back. How? Although signals from Moore on the Confederate left were not received, the sounds from the fighting and the Confederate disturbed appearance in front led Avril to conclude that it was time for the attack at center. He said, time. Avril's three mounted infantry regiments began advancing up the mountain while dismounted, with Francis Thompson's 3rd West Virginia Infantry making the most progress in the 8th West and the 8th West Virginia Infantry struggling with the steep and barren mountainside. Wow. Pussies. You guys are West Virginians. They face sharpshooters, musket fire from breastworks, and battery fire of grape and canister as well. Oh, shit. Schoonmaker briefly advanced two guns from Ewing's battery partially up the mountainside, where they fired upon the 22nd Virginia Infantry. Return fire from Chapman and Lurdy caused the Union guns to back off. The 3rd West Virginia Infantry found Moore's left, and Echoes began to, f- to face five Union regiments on his left and center. He's like, oh. The Confederate center was strongly defended by portions of the 14th Virginia Cavalry, commanded by Colonel Cochran. All right. <laughs> and 20th Virginia Cavalry, commanded by Colonel, uh, Colonel Arnett. When the Union regiments reached the breastworks, the fighting was hand-to-hand at the top. As Confederate soldiers used their empty muskets as clubs. They were playing uh, King of the Hill. <clears throat> right. After Union soldiers began sticking only their pistols over the breastworks and firing blindly, the Confederates eventually retreated. Second West Virginia Infantry, which had the most casualties of the three center attack regiments, was the first to enter the Confederate breastworks. Both Jackson and McLaughlin recognized that the Confederate center defense was faltering and moved most of the artillery to the rear where it could be used to cover a retreat if necessary. All right. Good for them. Although the 23rd Virginia Infantry Battalion helped William Thomas's men stall Moore's large infantry force, the Confederates on the extreme left were being driven back toward the center, forming a dangerous angle in their line. After receiving a report from Thompson, Eccles shifted Patton and three companies to the left and joined Jackson at the center. The reinforcements temporarily checked the Union advanced, but sustained a high number of casualties and was not strong enough to stop Moore's advance. Can do it. Uh, The Confederate center and right were also in trouble as Ewing's battery found a target and some of Jackson's men began fleeing toward the rear. Hmm. Uh Uh-oh, things falling apart. Yep, a signal man from the 68th New York Infantry Signal Corps detachment observed the Confederate disarray and Aver received the news near uh, 3 p.m. Aver ordered Major Thomas Gibson, whose independent cavalry battalion was held in reserve almost four miles back, to advance as quickly as possible. Hmm. A section of Ewing's battery was also sent in pursuit. The battle was mostly finished by 4 p.m., and Echoes received news about then that Duffy was at a mountain stop only, a mountain top, mountain stop, <laughs> only 18 miles west of Lewisburg. Really? With both his left and right flanks breached, Echoes ordered Jackson and Patton to fall back. Fantastic. Uh, Major Blessing and the <laughs> 23rd Infantry Battalion, which was Derek's battalion, don't right. forget that, were ordered to fall back to the road uh, to Lewisburg. Lewisburg. Right. right. Moore's infantry advanced from the Confederate left to the Confederate right where the old Rebs artillery had been posted on a hill. Hmm. Although the Rebs were unable to, were able to withdraw their last two pieces of artillery that were still on the hill, Moore's presence caused some Confederate panic, as men feared being cut off and captured. He's like, man, we gotta go. No time to mess around, we gotta go. One of the last Confederate officers to leave Droop Mountain was Major Robert Augustus Bailey of the 22nd Virginia Infantry. Bailey was mortally wounded, trying to rally his men. His regiment started the battle with 550 men and had 113 casualties. The regiment also had three captains wounded, two seriously, and was lo- one lieutenant mortally wounded. Oh. By the time Bailey was shot, the pike to Lewisburg was blocked with artillery, caissons, and wagons, and horses. Oh. The Confederate retreat became even more urgent, and weapons were being thrown away as the men ran. Son of a said, bitch. Let's get out of here. Right. At least one officer is known to have ordered his company to get out and save yourselves. Many of the Confederate soldiers ran to the woods. Colonel Patton was unable to reorganize his command until he arrived at Frankfurt, which was 19 miles south of the battle. Damn. Both Colonel Cochran and Lieutenant Colonel Thompson were thought to be captured or moited, but but they were unharmed and eventually returned to the unit. <laughs> there they go. Right. The 26th Virginia Infantry Battalion, which had been posted on another road before the battle, became cut off from Echo's Brigade. Oh, poor guys. Yep, the first pursuers of the Confederate Army were Moore's infantry, who fired into the retreating rebels from the original location of the Confederate artillery. 
Moore described a scene of dead and wounded horses, a fast-moving mass that melted away by scattering through the woods south of the pike. Moore's infantry pursued the Confederates about six miles before stopping after dark to go into camp. Other pursuers were Gibson's Independent Cavalry Battalion and Ewan's Battery, who advanced about seven miles before falling back one mile in the dark. Schoonmaker reported going into camp at 8 p.m. I mean, yeah, it's been dark for three hours now. Yeah, November for sure. Duffy skirmished with the enemy pickets on Little Sewell Mountain on the 6th of November and continued on to Meadow Bluff about 15 miles from Lewisburg. <clears throat> his advance guard was briefly attacked at 2 a.m. on November 7th. Damn, let people sleep. <laughs> and his command was moving toward Lewisburg by 3 a.m. Right. The command arrived in Lewisburg at 9 a.m. As the Confederate rear guard was departing at this time at 9 a.m., most of the Confederate army passed through two hours earlier. The Confederate rear guard was the 16th Virginia Cavalry Regiment, which had been guarding the western approach to Lewisburg and had not endured fighting at Droop Mountain. Lucky cocksuckers. Right. Duffy began a pursuit with the 2nd West Virginia Cavalry as the advance, but returned to Lewisburg after finding blockades and a burnt bridge at the Greenbrier River. Oh, yeah. 2nd West Virginia Cavalry captured 110 head of cattle and a small number of the enemy. Nice. At Lewisburg, the knapsacks and knapsacks <laughs> and tents of the 22nd Virginia Infantry were captured in addition to supplies. You're finding too many knapsacks. <laughs> You're finding too many naps- <laughs> knapsacks. Tents. <laughs> <laughs> Arrowhead Schoonmaker's Cavalry in the advance on the morning of September or November 11th. I mean 7th. Right. Upon arriving in Lewisburg, Schoonmaker found looting that was ended by his uh-huh. provost marshal. Yeah, you yeah. can't have that. Can't loot. Right. Come on, guys. Duffer reported head. that Avro arrived in Lewisburg around 4.30 p.m. Fantastic. By the evening, Eccles was in Monroe County, close to the Virginia border at Salt Sulphur. Oh. Salt Sulphur, huh? The pursuit of Eccles ended on the 8th of November, and Avro and Duffy appeared to blame each other for the stoppage. Avro reported that he began the pursuit on the morning of the 8th of November, but ended the search because of the formidable blockade. It was He was being encumbered with prisoners and captured property. He's like, so many captured property and prisoners, right. and Duffy's infantry being unfit for further operations. Duffy's report said he made the pursuit on the morning of November 8th with his cavalry and mounted infantry, and he received an order from General Avro to return when he was eight miles from Union, West Virginia. Mm, what's going on here? Right. One important factor in the decision to end the chase was that Avro was informed that reinforcements would be waiting for Echoes at the Dublin Rail Depot. So Avro clearly told him to stop. Avro, you lying piece right. of shit. Although he could not have known, only the 36th Virginia Infantry Regiment with a battery was moving towards Echoes' destination of Salt Pond Mountain. Okay. 26th Virginia... <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> the 26th Virginia Infantry Battalion, which did not engage at Droop Mountain and became cut off from the main force was able to reunite with Echoes in Virginia by November 10th uh-huh. and had several hundred additional men that fled the battle Fantastic. as well. Duffy began to move to Meadow Bluff as ordered, but found that location impractical because of bad weather and difficulties with the supply line. Oh, man. He endured a snowstorm on Sewell Mountain and returned to Charleston on November 13th. Oh, shit. Don't like those snowstorms. Nope. Moore, with the 28th Ohio Infantry, the 10th West Virginia, the 10th West Virginia Infantry and Keeper's Battery, was sent back to Beverly. Moore took the prisoners and wounded and reached his destination on the 12th of November. Avro moved north with the cavalry, mounted infantry, and Ewing's battery. They moved through White Sulphur Springs, where Avro learned that enemy troops were nearby. And Baden reached Covington in Virginia's Allegheny County on the 8th of November. There, he found one to 200 men from Jackson's command that had fled Drew Mountain. During that night, more men arrived. He also had 800 more men and two six-pounder guns from the Rockbridge Home Guard and cadets about 13 miles away at Clifton Ford. Oh, shit. Avro detached two squadrons of the 8th West Virginia Mounted Infantry under the command of Major Hedgeman Slack, hell of a name, on the evening of November 8th. On the next day, Slack had a small confrontation with Embodden's rear guard near Covington, capturing 21 of those men. However, Slack believed that Embodden was moving his command south towards Virginia and Tennessee Railroad to reinforce Echoes, and neither side pursued each other. Right. Well, you can't pursue each other. You would... That would be going into battle. <laughs> right. <laughs> Avro reached New Creek on November 17th, being bringing prisoners and captured horses. Oh, nice. Captured horses. Avro had 45 men moited, including those mortally wounded. Okay. He also had 93 wounded and two captured. Okay. Total of 140 casualties agrees with the National Park Service summary. Thank Okay. <laughs> Whatever. The original report listed 30 men killed as part of the 119 casualties. Although some of the mortally wounded may not have died at the time of the report. Well, clearly. The 10th West Virginia Infantry, followed by the 28th Ohio, had most of the casualties. 
for uh, Confederate troops, 33 were moited, 121 wounded, 122 captured. 19th Virginia Cavalry and 22nd Virginia Infantry had the most casualties. The total of 276 casualties also matches the count of 275 reported. Almost matches. Well, right. Almost matches the 275 reported by Eccles. And it is used by the National Park Service. I would say it almost <laughs> I mean, one on. off. Right, jeez. <laughs> uh, Ever reported that his Droop Mountain victory was decisive and the enemy's retreat became a total rout. However, Duffy reported that had General Avril, instead of attacking the enemy in force and making a general engagement, engaged him lightly, detaining him until my command reached Lewisburg, it is my opinion that we might have captured almost the entire rebel force. Probably. Well, these guys aren't working together in again, mm -hmm. huh? The Confederates were aware that if they had held their line at the mountain, they would have become trapped between Duffy and Avril. Clearly. All right. They also knew that they... They also knew that had they not retreated when they did, they would have been surrounded by Avro's two wings of infantry led by Moore and Oli. The guy. Yeah, they had to get out of there. Yeah. Especially you're on a hill. Right. You got to go, bud. Got to go. One historian was critical of Avro's decision to end the mission, writing that if Avro had the drive and the instinct for the jugular of someone like Philip Sheridan or George Armstrong Custer, he would have continued pursuing Eccles and gone on to the railroad bridge. Mm, easy for you to say historian. Right, yeah. Let's see you do it, bud. Right. November 7th, Major General Sam Jones sent a report to General Samuel Cooper in Richmond requesting assistance and saying that Eccles was badly defeated, closely what pursued. What a right. fucking snitch. <laughs> he was closely pursued and would probably not escape, he says. By the 15th of November... Jones believed the Jones believed the affair at Droop Mountain was not as big of a loss as he originally thought. And then on December 11th, he reported that Confederate troops had reoccupied the positions held prior to the battle, and the enemy had suffered heavier losses than those inflicted. After the Battle of Droop Mountain, the only major battles in West Virginia were the Battle of Moorfield, the Battle of Summit Point, and the Battle of Smithfield Crossing. All three battles were in the eastern panhandle of the state. Some historians conclude that Confederate resistance in West Virginia collapsed after the Battle of Droop Mountain. However, the Confederates returned to their original positions in December, and fighting may have simply sifted to the Shenandoah Valley. It did. At worst, for the Union cause, the Battle of Droop Mountain can be considered a tactical victory for Eccles, mm. since the Confederate Army was not eliminated from West Virginia, and the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad was unharmed. So, yeah, That's I think true. Anything. I think it was a stalemate. Well, sure. <laughs> Technically, a Union one. They controlled the battlefield afterwards. Yep, afterwards. In December, Halleck What's again. <laughs> right. In December, Halleck again ordered Avril to destroy the railroad, and another expedition started. At best, the Battle of Drew Mountain was a sound victory for Avril and a morale booster. Old President Abe Lincoln made reference to the battle in a speech, and Major General Ambrose Burnside confirmed that the victory encouraged his Army of the Ohio and Tennessee. Well, good for you. Right. Avril was often criticized for being too cautious and was removed in September 1864 as a division <laughs> commander by General Philip Sheridan for not pursuing the enemy promptly enough. Right. This guy, or again, did he do it? Right. However, Avril was one of the few Union cavalry leaders that achieved cavalry victories in the Eastern Theater before Sheridan, or Sheridan arrived. Yeah, because the old Rebs and their cavalry were kicking ass. Right. In addition to Droop Mountain, he soundly defeated the Confederates at the Battle of Rutherford's Farm and the Battle of Moorfield. He also performed well at the Battle of Kelly's Ford. Historian Scott Patchen noted that Avro had successes while serving as an independent or quasi-independent commander, 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 while his failures arose when his superiors expected him to cooperate within the framework of a larger command structure. Right. He said, I'm a loner. Mm -hmm. Loner's got to be a loner. Yeah. Well, Avro and Eccles were the generals on the field at the Battle of Droop Mountain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, they were. <laughs> of the Union leaders in the battle, Harris, Moore, and Ole eventually became generals. Oh, look at that shit. Schoonmaker led a charge against a fort in the Third Battle of Winchester, and he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Would you rather be a general or a Medal of Honor recipient? Right. Harris served on the commission that tried <laughs> to... <laughs> the question, but... <laughs> <laughs> Harris served on the commission that tried the Lincoln assassination conspirators. Oh, uh, for the Confederates, Jackson eventually became a general. Well, Patton would have become a general if he had survived his wounds received at the Third Battle of Winchester. So, Spoiler. Right. Patton is the grandfather of the famous World War II tank commander, George S. Patton. Oh, granddaddy died in the Civil War, huh? Right. Oh. And the battlefield site is preserved and administered by the West Virginia as Droop Mountain Battlefield State Park and is listed on the National Historic Places Register. The park was dedicated in 1928 and is West Virginia's oldest state park. Unknown Confederate dead from the battle are buried in the Confederate Cemetery at Lewisburg, which is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places. 
All right, got some action finally going on in this old podcast of ours, huh? This thing of ours. I like it. I like it a lot. It's good stuff. Still some incompetence, though, from yeah, I mean, the old ribs. Uh, for both of them, they're all both and idiots. Um, yeah, good stuff. 55 minute Next week. Right? Rappahannock! Rappahannock Station! Next week, we'll have the Battle of Rappahannock Station and the Battle of the Battles of Charlottesville. I think. Nope. Not yet. Maybe they are. Are they? Well, they got the Battle of Campbell Station. And... Look, I'm on one of those. Oh, wait, the battles of Chattanooga, that's what it is. Yeah. Um but Lookout Mountain is the first one in that, so I think we'll probably next week be a another shorter one where we'll have the Rappahannock Station and the Battle of Campbell Station. Right. Then the week after that we'll have the Battle of Lookout Mountain and the Battle of Missionary Ridge, which are the battles of Chattanooga. So some good stuff coming up here and got some good stuff coming up on our um Outlaws and Gunslingers podcast as well as next week's subject of the Bonanno family bosses are uh, Joseph Messino. A nice little, nice little long story for him. So we got after three or four episodes for each of these podcasts of having multiple subjects in one, we're we're gonna have uh, well. For Outlaws and Gunslingers, we'll have one guy, but we'll have a couple here. But, I mean, it's still going to be like 40, 45-minute episodes, not none of those 20-minuters. Other than that, you go check out, according to Wikipedia, the show that got us banned. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go check out that Kamala Harris episode, though, it's obviously on our uh, podcast um, page, Bang Dang Network, or it's on our Rumble um, channel at uh, Bang Dang Network over there as well. So if you guys were interested in what I got us banned, maybe you can tell us what got us right. banned because we don't know. Right. And yeah, so. but our newest episode of According Wikipedia, we talked all about chess or read all about chess, I guess. <laughs> we'll be covering for you warheads out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll be covering. We'll be reading the uh, American Revolutionary War page yeah, for baby. our next episode. So. Yeah. War stuff over there. According to Wikipedia, Outlaws, Gunslingers, Battles of the Americans of the War, Lee and Corey, all on our YouTube channel. So give it a subscription and like and review here on the podcast app. And we'll see you next week for a couple more battles on the Battles of the Americans of the War. We are the Mother Music Ganders with... Bang, bang.